Darwin once ate a rare bird by accident. During his journey around the world in HMS Beagle, Charles Darwin ate puma which he thought tasted like veal, armadillos and iguanas, he ate a 20-pound rodent, probably an agouti which he described as the very best meat I ever tasted, he not only ate Galapagos giant tortoises, but also drank their bladders, the fluid was quite limpid and had only a very slightly bitter taste, his habit of eating everything, he came across led him on one occasion, to accidentally devour a highly sought after bird a lesser rhea. No specimen of the bird South America's version of an ostrich had ever been seen in Europe, and Darwin was determined to become the first naturalist to send a specimen back home, he spent months trying to catch one, but the bird was fast, agile, and incredibly hard to catch. Then one day in 1834, a shipmate showed Darwin a bird he had just shot and asked if he wanted it, or whether they should cook it for dinner, absent-mindedly Darwin said they should eat it, that evening Darwin was halfway through dinner, when he suddenly jumped up and shouted at everybody to stop eating. He had just realized that they were eating a lesser rhea, he ran around grabbing bones from people's plates, and rushed to the ship's mess where he found the head, the neck bones the feet some feathers, and assorted bits and pieces, he packaged up all he could find and sent it to a taxidermist friend in London. The buddy eventually managed to construct a bird using what Darwin had sent him, with the help of wires and feathers purloined from the more common greater rhea, for which there were many specimens available. A Famous Painter's Intimacy Habits Belle Epoque painter Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec made Parisian nightlife, and France's world of entertainment his specialty, and documented it with keen psychological insight, among the pioneers of the post-impressionist period, he ranks along the likes of Van Gogh and Gauguin, his work was marked by an extreme simplification of outlines and movement, and the frequent use of large color areas, he had a strong urge to be intimate with ladies of the night, so strong that he lived in brothels. His private life was marked by a fixation on these women, which spilled over into his art and influenced his paintings. In his teens Toulouse-Lautrec broke his thigh bones in a couple of accidents, and the mishaps required extensive periods of painful convalescence, he filled the lonely hours by painting. The accidents left him with atrophied legs, and made walking difficult for the rest of his life. He moved to Paris in the early 1880s, and devoted himself to becoming an artist, he also devoted himself to the nightlife and the women that came with it. When he was not in Parisian brothels, Toulouse-Lautrec frequently visited cabarets in Paris Montmartre district, such as the Moulin Rouge. There he associated with many courtesans called girls of a higher caliber. The Moulin Rouge actually reserved a table for him every night, and displayed his paintings. He also enjoyed checking out the theater, circus and dance halls, in the company of his paid company. A habit that proved deadly. As much as Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec liked paying these women to be intimate, they liked him back, they befriended him, modeled for him, and even supported him when he was broke, working women and madams accepted the crippled artist as a fellow outcast, he liked their company so much, that he would sometimes pack up and move into brothels, to live there for months on end, he liked to shock people by giving the address of a famous brothel as his place of residence, he was allowed to freely wander around the establishments, to sketch and paint what he saw as the muse took him, and he became known for his paintings of ladies of the night. Toulouse-Lautrec lived in an era when working women were common and easy to access, and most men routinely made use their services. Still even in the socially liberal France of the late 19th century, women of the night were a taboo subject. Toulouse-Lautrec broke the taboo by painting working women as they were. He neither glamorized nor vilified them, but simply depicted the everyday life he shared with them in a near-documentary fashion. He died at age 36 from advanced syphilis, which he got from one of his lady friends. China's Teenage Emperor Zhu Haozhao ascended the Ming Dynasty's throne, and was crowned as the Zhengde Emperor in 1505, when he was 14 years old. Unsurprisingly the teenager had little interest in the boring work of government, and disregarded state affairs, also unsurprisingly for a teenager suddenly thrust in a position of absolute power, and given access to untold wealth, he went nuts, he left the business of running China to his courtiers and officials, and lived it up like only a teenager who could suddenly do whatever he wanted could live it up, the young emperor led an extravagant and profligate lifestyle, marked by lavish spending, bizarre behavior and poor choices. Such conduct set the stage for the Ming dynasty's eventual downfall, the new emperor was in the habit of wholly ignoring his imperial duties, as soon as he ascended the throne. He turned governance over to trusted eunuchs, 
and devoted himself to pleasure-seeking. With the levers of power left entirely in their hands, palace eunuchs became China's most powerful class. Without checks or oversight, corruption became endemic and public offices were openly bought and sold, taxes soared to pay for the emperor's pleasures, and to feather the nests of courtiers and officials. A Frivolous Emperor with Many an Unsavory Habit Zhu Haojiao liked to travel incognito around China, it was a pro forma incognito, most of the time, it was obvious just who he was. He was also into make-believe, and was in the habit of creating elaborate alter egos for himself, one such was a general Zhu Zhu, upon whom the young emperor lavished praise and rewards, he also built a city block within the forbidden city, China's imperial palace, so he could pretend to be a shopkeeper. Less innocent and more harmful was his bandit and kidnapper alter ego. In that guise the emperor took his companions on thrill raids, in which they burst into the homes of wealthy citizens. They would violently seize and kidnap the household's daughters, carry them off to a hideout, and hold them for ransom. Those who criticized the emperor's erratic and irresponsible behavior were arrested, tortured, and executed by the hundreds. Zhu eventually drowned in 1521 when one of his pleasure barges sank, and finally brought his reign to a merciful end. Although he was dead, the damage he left behind proved permanent. In his reign without oversight from the throne, palace eunuchs achieved such power within the government structure, that subsequent emperors were unable to dislodge them. Their endemic corruption wrecked the Ming dynasty's effectiveness, and was a major cause of its eventual collapse. A Great Biographer's Hidden Habit Dyer's James Boswell was a friend of Samuel Johnson, the writer and poet who compiled the first comprehensive English dictionary. Boswell's biography of Johnson is considered one of the best biographies ever written. Indeed so close had Boswell been to Johnson, that Boswell became a term for a close companion who observes, and records the deeds of a great figure. Less known about Boswell is that he hankered after women non-stop. Boswell had a difficult relationship with his father, which made him depressed and melancholic. Intimacy cheered him up, between ages 20 and 29, as gleaned from his diary, Boswell slept with three married gentlewomen, four actresses and kept three mistresses, he also had a fling with Jean-Jacques Rousseau's mistress. Those figures were eclipsed by the more than 60 working women he slept with in that period, those women lifted his spirits, at least temporarily, and the habit cheered him up, Boswell chased after them wielding his armor, a reusable condom made of sheep guts that had to be moistened with water before use. A typical escapade from Boswell's diary went thus, as I was coming home this night I felt carnal inclinations raging throw my frame, I determined to gratify them, I went to St. James's Park and like Sir John Brute, picked up a woman, for the first time did I engage in armor which I found but a dull satisfaction. She who submitted to my lusty embraces was a young Shropshire girl only seventeen, very well looked her name Elizabeth Parker, poor being she has a sad time of it. A Guilty Habit Every now and then James Boswell felt bad about his bad habit, however he couldn't help himself, and kept coming back, as he wrote in his diary entry of May 10, 1763, at the bottom of the Haymarket, I picked up a strong jolly young damsel, and taking her under the arm I conducted her to Westminster Bridge, and then in armor complete did I engage her upon this noble edifice, the whim of doing it there with the Thames rolling below us amused me much, yet after the brutish appetite was sated I could not but despise myself for being so closely united with such a low wretch. The armor, which Boswell also referred to in his diary as a condom, was supposed to protect against venereal disease, but proved ineffective. The fact that his first streetwalker, when he was 19 gave him gonorrhea, neither extinguished Boswell's faith in his armor, nor dampened his enthusiasm for women. By the time he was 29, Boswell had been with at least 60 ladies of the night, from whom he contracted gonorrhea an astonishing 19 times. His friends treated his frequent VT infections as a running joke, however considering the primitive medical care of the 18th century. The bouts were probably too painful for Boswell to appreciate the humor. A dictator who habitually bit more than he could chew. Benito Mussolini, founder of Italy's fascist party, was Italy's prime minister and leader from 1922 to 1943. He was the first European fascist dictator and was an inspirational figure for Adolf Hitler, who modeled himself after Mussolini during his own rise to power. Eventually the Italian dictator was overshadowed by his German imitator, and Mussolini ended up as Hitler's sidekick. Mussolini had delusions of grandeur, and sought to revive the Roman Empire. Neither he nor Italy were up to the task, 
however, and Mussolini often bit more than he could chew. The results of his habit of overreaching were often farcical, and led to humiliating setbacks. Towards the end of his career, having dragged an unprepared Italy into World War II and bungled it badly, Mussolini's image morphed from that of a great statesman to a hapless buffoon. It ended badly for him, when his countrymen captured him in the final days of World War II in Europe. They offed him and his mistress, and displayed them in downtown Milan, suspended upside down by their ankles from meat hooks. That the man was a comic dictator was well known. That he was in the habit of penning erotic letters, though few knew of at the time. Il Duce's habit of penning erotic letters. Mussolini liked to unwind by penning erotic letters, the fascist dictator's habit of writing frequently cringe-worthy dirty letters, was discovered when the diary of Clara Patacci, the mistress taken out and strung up by his side, came to light in 2009. For all his shortcomings one thing Il Duce, Italian for leader, had going for him was an incredible libido and remarkable bedroom stamina, as described by Patacci. Mussolini often had up to 14 mistresses at a time, and would regularly go through three or four different women in a single evening. Mussolini was also jarringly loud during intimacy, his screams seemed like those of a wounded beast, as Patacci put it. He was a total hound who seemingly lusted after every woman he met, as he described it. After his first intimate encounter with a working woman at age 17, naked women entered my life. My dreams, my desires, I undressed them with my eyes, the girls that I met I lusted after them violently with my thoughts. Luckily for him many Italian women had the hots for him as well, and at the height of his power thousands sent letters propositioning him every day. Mussolini begged women to hit, hurt and punish him. Mussolini had underlings sort his fan letters by senders into known and new. After police background checks on the new women, the more interesting ones were put in folders and passed on to him, those who caught his eye usually big-breasted and broad-hipped, were summoned for an afternoon liaison at his palace. He wasted no time, and was in the habit of getting down to business immediately on the carpet, against the wall or on a stone window seat. Those who pleased him were added to his many mistresses and in correspondence with them, Mussolini held little back. Orgasm is good for you, it sharpens your thoughts, it widens your horizons, it helps your brain makes it vivid and brilliant. Or be afraid of my love, it's like a cyclone, it's tremendous, it overwhelms everything, you must tremble and I tremble in telling you, but I have a feverish desire for your delicious little body, which I want to kiss all over. And you must adore my body, your giant, or your flesh has got me from now on, I'm a slave to your flesh, and I'm bad, hit me, hurt me, punish me, but don't suffer, I love you, I think about you all day, even when I'm working. A Great Ballet Dancer's Secret Habit Born in the Russian Empire, Vaslav Nijinsky grew up to become one of history's greatest ballet dancers. His ability to dance on point on tippy toes was rare for male dancers in his day, and he captivated audiences with his spectacular leaps and sensitive interpretations. He got his start in classical ballets such as Swan Lake and Sleeping Beauty. Before he joined the Ballets Russe, a groundbreaking company of that era, his talents were so remarkable that special ballets were created just for him to showcase his skills. The man was a revolutionary force in dance, until his career was cut tragically short. The first blow was World War I, which broke out while he was in Budapest, he was Russian, which made him an enemy alien. So he spent the conflict interned, soon after the war ended, he was forced to retire from the stage in 1919, at age 29, because of a nervous breakdown caused by schizophrenia. He was also an addict, whose drug were women of the night, after his passing Nijinsky's wife published his diary, but years later researchers discovered that Nijinsky's widow had edited out of some interesting stuff, apparently there were some aspects of the marriage, that she did not want to share with the public, to wit, that her husband had a strong working woman habit. A habit that amounted to a compulsion. To say that Vaslav Nijinsky liked women is to understate, the man's habit of frequenting ladies of the night was an irresistible compulsion, he was ashamed of what he viewed as an unfortunate affliction, but could not refrain from gratifying his lust for working women, whom he referred to as tarts. Nijinsky's diary describes disappointments when he would look for a woman all day long and not find one, it also describes his joy upon finding them, and how he made love to several tarts a day on such occasions. Understandably that strained his marriage, after one spree with ladies of the night in Paris, Nijinsky's wife wanted to send him to Zurich for psychiatric treatment, he looked forward to it not because he was eager to improve his conduct, 
and his marriage but because of the opportunity to try out Zurich's working women. His obsession went beyond intimacy, he was actually interested in plumbing the minds of women, as he wrote in his diary, I will not be writing in Zurich because I am very interested in that town, I will go to a brothel because I want to have an intuitive understanding of tarts, I have forgotten tarts, I want to understand the psychology of a tart. For a medieval fundamentalist, Osama bin Laden sure kept a lot of videos. Osama bin Laden Al-Qaeda's founder, probably history's best-known terrorist, and the 21st century's most notorious villain, hardly needs an introduction the terror attacks masterminded, and carried out by his organization, particularly those of September 11, 2001, have seared his name in global, and especially American memories, less known however is how bin Laden liked to pass his free time when he was not running a virtual terror state. Apparently he did not spend all his time issuing fatwas against Jews, infidels, and backsliding Muslims or declaring and waging jihad against opponents of his Make Islam Great Again vision. In 2017 the CIA released over 470,000 files seized from his compound in the 2011 raid that ended him. The contents included about 174 gigabytes of video, 7.4 gigabytes of image files and 18 gigabytes of assorted documents, as it turned out bin Laden had some hobbies, and interests that stood in jarring contrast to his reputation and image. A terrorist leader's crocheting habit For all his decrying of the infidel West and its corrupting cultural influence upon Islam and Muslims, Osama bin Laden liked to partake of Western culture. On his personal laptop was an eclectic collection of saved videos. Unsurprisingly they included quite a bit of the gory stuff such as beheadings. Surprisingly they also included British slapstick comedy, as it turns out Bin Laden was a big fan of Rowan Atkinson, as evinced by the numerous episodes of Mr. Bean, that were discovered in his hard drive. Even more surprising, the terror mastermind liked crocheting, a habit that was probably as good a way as any to pass the time while in hiding, recovered from his laptop were 30 how to crotchet tutorial videos, including one for how to crotchet an iPod sock, in a surprisingly not surprising twist, the man whose network tortured, and ended people for smoking, drinking, dancing, or watching media depicting women not covered up in burkas, had explicit adult videos saved on his laptop. Turns out that bin Laden was just as hypocritical as most of those who bray the loudest about the licentiousness of the modern age. A kleptocrat couple Imelda Marcos is a Philippine public figure, and the widow of former dictator Ferdinand Marcos, who ruled from 1966 to 1986, during her years as First Lady of the Philippines, she held various government posts and wielded great power, such that she became a de facto co-ruler of the country towards the end of the Marcos dictatorship, known as the Steel Butterfly for her combination of fashion sense and steely resolve, Imelda took full advantage of her position to enrich herself with rampant corruption and blatant graft. The Marcos dictatorship was a kleptocracy, and the ruling couple plundered the country, they were eventually overthrown in a 1986 popular uprising, the People Power Revolution, and were forced to flee the Philippines. By then they had stashed enough wealth in secret Swiss bank accounts, and accumulated various properties overseas, to afford an extremely comfortable retirement in Hawaii, however they were unable to take all their ill-gotten gains and goodies with them. When the revolutionaries entered the Marcos palaces, they found evidence of an extravagant and opulent lifestyle, most starkly represented by Imelda's expensive designer shoe habit. A habit of splurging on designer shoes by the thousands. What attracted the most attention was Imelda Marcos' apparent obsession with expensive designer shoes. The former first lady had a habit of splurging on extremely pricey shoes and accumulated thousands of pairs. When protesters stormed one of her former residences, the Malakong Palace, they discovered over 2,700 pairs of designer shoes in Imelda's wardrobe. Thousands more designer shoes were found in other palaces, mansions, and villas throughout the Philippines. A single pair of those pricey pumps could cost more than residents of an entire city, block in a lower-class Philippine neighborhood earned in a year. Imelda Marcos's shoes were displayed at the presidential palace, as a symbol of the dictatorship's corruption, eventually hundreds of her shoes found a permanent home in the shoe museum, in the northern city of Marikina. The collection became a symbol of excess in a country, where many walked barefoot in abject poverty, however because life is often unfair, Imelda Marcos never paid for her corruption, she was eventually allowed back in the Philippines, was elected to parliament and as of 2022 is one of that country's wealthiest women. She even turned the shoe scandal into an asset, 
and has been a frequent visitor to the Shoe Museum, there she signs autographs and proudly poses for photos next to the display cases of her collection. This randy old goat's habit of getting it on whenever, and wherever he could eventually ended him. Henry John Templeton III Viscount Palmerston, and better known as Lord Palmerston, dominated British foreign policy from 1830 to 1865, when Britain was at the height of its power, he served as Secretary at War from 1809 to 1828, as Foreign Secretary from 1830 to 1841 and again from 1846 to 1851, and twice as Prime Minister from 1855 to 1858, and again from 1859 to 1865. In his private life, he was a randy old goat who was in the habit of getting it on whenever and wherever he could. Lord Palmerston is the only British Prime Minister to have ever passed in office, and know what an ending it was, on October 18, 1865, the 80-year-old Prime Minister, who enjoyed robust health well past his biblical three-score and ten, reportedly was getting it on with a maid on a billiard table. He seems to have overexerted himself, which led to his demise in the midst of his illicit romance, just two days shy of his 81st birthday. The Kleptocrat King Egyptian King Farouk I reigned from 1936, until he was thrown off his throne by a coup in 1952. His years as Egypt's last king were marked by widespread corruption, incompetent governance and bizarre conduct. A kleptomaniac Farouk could not resist stealing things, and was in the habit of picking people's pockets. He also was an avid collector of adult entertainment. He was popular early in his reign, when he ascended the throne as a slim and handsome young man. The goodwill was quickly squandered by his incompetent governance, and his good looks were soon ruined by a gluttony that saw him balloon to 300 pounds. He soon became an object of derision, widely lampooned as a stomach with a head. His lavish lifestyle while his subjects endured the hardships of World War II further eroded his popularity. Farouk took pickpocketing lessons and as seen below, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, whom he hosted at a dinner during World War II, was one of his victims. This king's pickpocketing habit was eclipsed by his adult entertainment habit. During a state dinner hosted by King Farouk, Winston Churchill discovered that his pocket watch, a prized family heirloom, had gone missing. After an outcry and search, the Egyptian king who had been seated next to Churchill, sheepishly turned it in, claiming to have found it. It was just one example of Farouk's bizarre behavior. Early in World War II he had repeated nightmares in which he was chased by a ravenous lion, frazzled from loss of sleep. He consulted the rector of Cario's ancient Al-Azhar University, who advised him you will not rest until you have shot a lion, so Farouk went to the zoo and shot two lions in their cages. By 1952 Farouk's corruption and maladministration had completely eroded his standing, and he was overthrown in a coup, hastily fleeing Egypt he left most of his possessions behind, the new government auctioned his belongings, and in the process discovered his stash of adult entertainment. This was in the days when it all was hard copy, Farouk had entire rooms filled with the stuff, and it soon became clear that the Egyptian king had a serious adult magazine habit, so serious that he had amassed the world's biggest adult entertainment collection, he settled first in Monaco, then in Rome where he literally ate himself away, collapsing at a restaurant dinner table after a heavy meal in 1965. The Chairman Poet Mao Zedong was China's main Marxist theorist, and a guerrilla fighter soldier and statesman, who presided over his country's communist revolution, he led the Chinese Communist Party from 1935 until his passing, and after the communists won control in 1949. He ruled China from that date until his demise. During his time in power, Mao was responsible for the eradication of tens of millions Chinese, they were ended outright by his followers, or starved because of Mao's disastrous economic policies. However, there was more to Chairman Mao than just a revolutionary man of action. He had a particular fondness for classical Chinese poetry and literature, in addition to being a horrible person who should have never existed. Mao was also a prolific writer and poet. Surprisingly, for a man so politically radical and revolutionary, he was in the habit of writing and penning verses in classical Chinese forms. It would be akin to a modern American anarchist, who liked writing in the manner of Chaucer. <laughs>